Okay, Valeria, whenever you are ready. Okay. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, hello, everyone. Um, welcome to another, uh, to this week's instance of, of the Topos Colloquium. Um, today, you have a great pleasure of having Noam Zeilberger talking to us from Paris. And Noam is assistant professor in the LIX, which is a much easier way of saying the Laboratoire d'Informatique de l'Ecole Polytechnique. Uh, and, and I kind of, I have discussed lots of uh, interesting work, Noam. If you go to his webpage, you'll see that he has an awful lot of interesting work on very different areas of both mathematics and programming. And I kind of had thought that uh, inviting Noam that, he, Noam that he would be talking about uh, lambda calculus and combinatorics and counting is a classes of beta normal linear lambda calculus, but I think he decided to talk a, 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 about some of his recent work with Paul André Melier that, as he says, he's going to present in MFPS 2022. And so it's a, a great pleasure to have uh, Noam coming. Take it away, Noam. Thank you very much, Valeria, for the introduction, and, and thank you very much for the, the invitation. I'm very uh, thankful for the opportunity to, to speak to people here. And uh, so, <clears throat> as uh, Valeria mentioned, this is about joint work with Paul André Melias, um, that it actually is a result of a long-running project that we've had for, for several years, which is an offshoot of our work on type refinement systems. Um, and Alex, I'll say a little word about that in just a second. And it's like the first half of the title of this talk, the parsing as a lifting problem, is something project that we started really um, multiple years ago. And it's only a few months ago that we decided to look at this uh, so-called chomsky schutzenberger representation theorem. Um, and lots of surprising things came as a result of, of that. And so things that, that were very uh, you know, exciting to us and surprising. So I hope that you'll find it interesting. Um, <clears throat> so, so I wanted to begin with a little introduction. And as I said, you know, this is an offshoot in some ways of our work on, on type refinement systems. And so with your permission, I wanted to begin with just a little bit of uh, propaganda about this work. And so it um, resulted from you know, thinking about the relationship between, between type theory and, and category theory. And I'm uh, wondering whether there was, there was something which was a little bit off in the way that we usually think about type systems in terms of via the lens of category theory, interpreting type systems as categories. And, and the problem is basically that this uh, interpretation collapses the distinction between terms typing judgments and typing derivations. These are three different concepts which, um, which people consider in type theory, which are collapsed really under this interpretation of type systems as categories. And so there's something inadequate. And, and the basic solution to this that we propose is that very simple solution, instead of thinking of type systems as categories, you should rather consider them as functors, DRT, uh, from a category D, whose morphisms we think about, we think of as typing derivations to a category T, whose morphisms we, th we think of as terms, which are the underlying subjects of those typing derivations. And so I'll just show you a picture quickly to, to explain what, what I mean. Um, so here's a little picture of a very small little category, we'll call it T, and we think of the morphisms of this category as terms. So F is a term. It has some so-called intrinsic type associated to it because after all, it's an arrow of a category. So it has a domain and codomain. Um, but now the idea is that we want to build a type system on top of this category. So we're going to introduce another category, D, which maps down to T via functor. And well, this category has some objects in it. And so we can already talk about something we're going to call a typing judgment. We're going to give a mathematical status to the notion of typing judgment. And it consists of a triple RFS of this shape, where you have an object R that lies over the domain of, of F and an object S which lies over the codomain of F. And this triple... This triple we, we think of as a typing judgment, which is asserting in some way that F has a more precise type, the type RRS. 
So it's asserting that, but we don't know whether it's actually true or not. This is just a typing judgment. What constitutes evidence for the judgment or derivation of the judgment? Well, that's just a morphism alpha from R to S, which maps down to the, the morphism F. <clears throat> and this is the basic idea uh, in, in sch schematically of looking at a functor as a type system, again, with uh, the terms lying in the morphism in the category T, and then building typing derivations on top of it inside of another category. Now, <clears throat> We, we looked at this view, um, so I gave a reference in this paper, functors are type refinement systems. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about this, I, I really recommend that you go look at the paper. We wrote a couple of other papers as well. And we really have in mind that um, this is more than just about type systems, but really this is a useful way of looking at deductive systems in general. And, and this work that I'm going to talk about is about derivability in context-free grammars, which is a, a classic topic in computer science uh, with many applications. And the basic starting point is going to be the idea that we're going to represent context-free grammars, again, as functors, uh, but not functors of categories, but rather functors of operates, DRT, uh, where D is going to be a freely generated operad, and T is going to be something pretty specific, it's going to be something that we call the operate of spliced words, a, sp um, a certain operate that we construct over a given alphabet. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. Now, um, <clears throat> I hope that many of you have heard about operates um, or about multi-categories, which are the same thing. So just a note on usage, whenever I say operate, I really mean colored operate. <clears throat> and which is, and I mean exactly the same thing as, as multi-category, just using the terminology of operad. So an operad or, or a colored operad, it has a, a set of colors, or you can think of a set of objects um, in multi-category terminology. And then it also has a set of operations and operations are just like morphisms of a category, except that they can have multiple inputs and one output. So here I've just drawn some pictures of, of operations in an operand, F, which is a ternary operation, uh, R, B, G, R, Y. And we draw these little pictures of tree, uh, a node of a tree, which has the inputs R, B, and G coming in, and then an output uh, Y. Here's a binary operation G, C is a constant, which just has the output R. <clears throat> An operand is also equipped with identity operations. So for every color, uh, there is an identity operation associated to that color. Uh, so identity on, on G, we can draw it like this as just, just an edge with no internal node. And then uh, we can compose operations. And this is usually expressed either in terms of so-called partial composition or parallel composition. Um, you can go back and forth between these. So partial composition, here we're taking the operation F and we're composing a constant C for the zeroth input. Just at attention, I'm using zero-based indexing for composition. <clears throat> um, so this is gonna give us a new operation which now, since we've plugged for, for R, this is going to have type B comma G R Y. Uh, we can also define parallel composition, which is when we compose F with, uh, with operations for all of its inputs. So here we've plugged it with C for the first input, G for the second input, and then the identity for the last input. And now we get a new operation of this type. And then we also have some axioms, some associativity and, and unitality axioms for composition and identity. And as I said, you can use either the partial composition or the parallel composition presentation. And then you know, with the right axioms, these, these two presentations are equivalent. So we're gonna go back and forth between using you know, the partial composition and the parallel composition when we talk about operats. Uh, and yes, if you have any questions during the talk, please feel free to to ask and uh, and hopefully Valeria will signal them to me. Uh, so uh, now a little reminder about context-free grammars. So the classical way that, that they're defined, um, a context-free grammar, it consists of a tuple, which is an alphabet sigma, uh, 
and sometimes these are called the terminal symbols. Then we have another set N, which is called the non-terminal symbols or the intermediate symbols. And then we have a distinguished element of N, which is called the start symbol. And then we have a set of production rules um, of this form R goes to sigma, where R is a non-terminal and sigma is a string of terminals and non-terminals. So it's in N union, the, the, in the, uh, the, the cleaning star of N union sigma. And then we can talk about derivations in a grammar, um, a derivation from one string of terminals and non-terminals to another string of non-terminals and terminals. Um, and it consists of a sequence of applications of production rules where we can apply a production rule in any context. So here we can go directly from sigma one to sigma two. If there's some, you know, we can split sigma one up into uh, R, the non-terminal R with some left context rho, some right context tau, and then we replace R by sigma, the, the right-hand side of this rule. So that's a direct derivation from sigma one to sigma two. And then the language generated by the grammar is the set of terminal strings, W, which you can, which can be derived from the start symbol S. These are the so-called the set of sentences that can be derived in the grammar. So that's a reminder about context-free grammars. But now we're gonna look at them in a different way, in a functorial way. And first, we're going to make a very simple observation, which is that whenever you have a production rule, R goes to sigma, you can factor it like so. So instead of sigma, we're going to, we're going to write, um, we can factor sigma as a string of terminal symbols, W0, followed by a single non-terminal R1, followed by another string of terminal symbols, W1, followed by so on until we have a non-terminal Rn followed by, again, some trailing string Wn. So here we factored it in terms of strings of non, strings of terminals. So in other words, words in sigma star together with non-terminal symbols in N. <clears throat> so, so this is very basic factorization, but now it's going to motivate us to introduce this so-called operator of spliced words. So if we look at this production rule, and now we forget about all of the non-terminals and we just remember the terminals, we see that we have a sequence W0, W1, Wn of, of uh, terminal strings of words. So in fact, we have N plus one words here and I've separated them by, by N dashes. And so this is going to define our operad. It's gonna be an uncolored operad where we see this sequence of N plus one strings as an n-area operation. <clears throat> and this defines an operad where uh, the composition is performed by splicing into the gaps. By, by gap, I mean these the dashes. And so, so for example, here we have a binary operation, ha ha ha. It has two gaps, so it's a binary operation. And we're defining the parallel composition with foo, which is just a constant, and bar, baz, which is a unary operation. And we do that by plugging foo in for the first gap and plugging bar, gap, baz for the second gap. And what we're left with is this operation, ha, foo, ha, bar, gap, ba, baz, ha, which is a unary operation derived by, uh, you know, by composition. So now the idea is that we will represent our context-free grammar as a functor into the spliced words operand. It's a, it's a functor into the spliced word operand from a freely generated operand. I'll, I'll say later, I'll, I'll make more precise what exactly I mean by, by a freely generated operand. But the idea is, well, we start with a collection of colors and the, the colors are just going to be the non-terminals of the grammar. So in, here I've given a little example, a very simple context-free grammar in traditional notation in the upper left corner. Um, so it has non-terminals S, N, P, and V, P. You know, these stand for sentence, noun phrase, and, and verb phrase. And then it has uh, a few very simple production rules. This You can think of this as a very small fragment of the English language. 
Um, and so we encode the production rules as little generators of an operand. So for example, the production rule one, we encode it as a binary operation, which goes from NP comma VP into S. We encode two and three as just constants, because you, if you look at it, there's no non-terminal on the right-hand side of the rule. <clears throat> so we're gonna encode them as, as constants. Uh, and then four is going to be encoded as a unary operation, which was from NP to VP. Uh, another thing I guess I should say is just, you know, the way that context-free grammars, the way the rules are usually oriented is exactly backwards to the way that rules are usually oriented for operads or multi-categories. So we're always going to flip the direction of, of the arrows. <clears throat> um, but now each of these little production rules, which corresponds to a generator of our of our operand also is going to be mapped down to this operand of spliced words. And this is gonna tell you how to insert the, the terminal strings. So for example, um, the production rule one is gonna be mapped down to this binary operation, which you can think of it as an operation which takes two strings and then inserts a blank space in between them. Um, then these two constants, two and three, are going to be sent to two terminal strings, mom and tom. And then this unary operation, uh, four, the production rule is going to be mapped down to this spliced uh, word, love space, gap, uh, epsilon. And now you can see how well we can build a derivation in the context-free grammar that's going to correspond to an operation that we build in the free operand. So in the free operand, we're allowed to compose these things basically as trees. Here we've, we've built up a parse tree, which is labeled by the production rules. And then when we map it down to the spliced word operand functorially, well, we get this composition of spliced words, of spliced words which now if we perform the actual uh, composition in the operand, we recover the string, Tom loves more. So, uh, so that's the, the basic idea um, of how we represent a context-free grammar as a functor from a freely generated opera to this opera of spliced words. And for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna be elaborating this idea. <clears throat> so now the, the first, uh, first observation is that in fact, this spliced words construction extends to a functor from categories to operads. So we can define a kind of spliced word operand, or we're, we're gonna call it the operand of spliced arrows over any category. And this is gonna let us define in a natural way, a notion of context-free grammar over any category. And we can use this to define context-free languages of arrows in a category. And you know, I'm gonna try to convince you um, that this is a natural way of looking at context-free grammars and that many standard concepts can be simplified by looking at it this way. And we're also gonna talk about some classical closure properties of context-free languages that how we can generalize them to context-free languages of arrows in a category. Then something else we're gonna see, um, surprising fact, is that this functor from categories to operands has a left adjoint, um, which we call the contour category construction. It's something which takes an operand and produces a category from it. And so we're going to talk about that, hopefully, um, because I haven't given this talk before and I'm not positive about the timing, but I'm gonna try to make it through. Um, so this, this contour category construction has a nice geometric interpretation and we're gonna use it to prove uh, the so-called chomsky schutzen berger representation theorem. And so if you don't, if you haven't heard of this theorem before, don't worry. Um, as I said, we also hadn't heard about it and since, I mean, until a few months ago, uh, but the basic statement of the theorem is that any context-free language is the homomorphic image of the intersection of a dyke language of uh, balanced brackets with a regular language. <clears throat> And then in order to prove the, this theorem, I'm gonna to have to talk in the middle about automata and, and how we can represent automata also functorially and how we can actually define automata over categories and over operands. I wanted to say now just a little word about related work. So this basic idea that I explained about looking at a context-free grammar as a functor from a free multi-category, is um, contained in a paper of, of Walters, a very uh, brief paper uh, called A Note on Context-Free Languages. It's five pages long. Um, it, it basically contains this idea 
Uh, it's not developed very much. It, it's also mentioned in a textbook that he wrote about co computer science and category theory. Um, the, I want to say that the idea is also closely related to work of Philippe de Grot uh, on um, what he calls abstract co categorical grammars and the way that he encodes context-free grammars as ACGs. Um, even though that work is expressed within the framework of lambda calculus rather than categories and operas, but it's very similar in spirit to to this idea. And if you're you know you want some more pointers, there's uh, you, you can have a look at the paper. There was a link in my first slide to to the paper, and I think it's also online. Uh, of course, we would be happy to have pointers to to more related work if you're aware of any related work and. Uh, as I said, I hope to be able to explain to you this adjunction, this, this so-called contour splicing adjunction between, between categories and, and operats. And it's something very basic and, and simple, and it would be surprising if it hasn't been noticed before. <clears throat> so, so now I want to begin and explain how we can uh, express context-free grammars functorially and how we can generalize that to context-free grammars over any category. So, as I said, the first ingredient is going to be to generalize the operand of spliced words. And so we're going to find the operand of spliced arrows over any category, uh, like so. So, again, it's going to be a colored operand. The colors are going to be pairs of objects of, of C. And then the n -ary operations, so an n -ary operation, which is going to have a type that looks like this, A1, B1, a to B to A and B N, arrow A B, it's going to consist of a sequence of N plus one arrows, W0, W1, Wn, uh, which we draw them as a sequence separated by these hyphens, gaps, with some typing constraints. So basically, it, the, we're good, the constraint is that Wi is going to be a morphism in C from Bi to Ai plus one, with some boundary conditions. So, we're, so you can take this definition where we take B0 to, to equal A, um, so like the left-hand side of the, of the codomain, and we take AN plus one to BB. I'll show you a picture on the next slide, which is gonna make this definition more clear. Then uh, composition is gonna be, again, it's gonna be performed by splicing into the gaps, but now in a typed way. And I'll show you a picture that will make this clear. And then the identity operation on AB is gonna be, given by the pair of identities. So identity A followed by identity B. And the idea is that this is really a generalization of the operand that I showed you earlier, where you can take W sigma to be um, this construction for the free monoid over sigma seen as a one object category. So a category with just one object that we can call star, and then it has an arrow corresponding to every uh, letter of the alphabet, and you can compose these. So in fact, for every word, um, in sigma, you have an arrow from star to star. Um, so this is a generalization of the previous construction. So now let me show you a picture to make this more clear. So this is an example on the left-hand side. This is an example of a ternary operation of the operator of spliced arrows over some category C. Again, it consists of words W0, W1, W2, W3, rather arrows, where e these arrows have these types. So W0 is an arrow from A to A1. W1 is from B1 to A2. <clears throat> and you see, that I've also drawn in gray these gaps. And these gaps you can really think of as gaps, so there's nothing there, but we want to visualize um, visualize this, this gap between the objects. You, know, you can think of kind of, so we take we use W1 to go from B1 to A2, then we, we jump over the gap to B2, and now we use W2 to go from B2 to A3, then we jump over to B3, and now we go back down along W3 to B. So this is the way that we define operations. Um, also, as a special case of this definition, a constant of type AB is going to be just an arrow from A to B. <clears throat> and with this definition of morphisms, we're going to be able to compose them in a very natural way. Um, so, so here's an example of partial composition where we've taken this ternary operation here, and now we're composing it with another binary operation with you know, three morphisms, U0, U1, U2 of the appropriate type. 
And you can see how we can compose just using composition in the underlying category. So we compose you know, W1 and U0, and that's going to give us a morphism W1, U0. I'm using sequential composition. Um, and you know, similarly, uh, so this is the operation that we get by composition in this operand. And you see the result now is going to be a, a four array operation of this type. So that's the definition of this operand. If there's any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. Um, now, it's, it's pretty easy to see that this actually defines a functor from, from cat to operand in the sense that whenever you have a functor of categories from C to D, then that's going to induce a corresponding functor of operands, WF, from W of C, so the spliced words over C to spliced words over D. And it's just, if you, you know, look at this picture, if you think of this as a diagram in C, now we have a functor F taking us from C to D, well, we can map this whole diagram to a diagram in D. That's going to give us a spliced word in this operand of spliced words over D, spliced arrows over D. <clears throat> okay, so, so that's the first ingredient. Now, um, I want to talk about uh, free operands. And, and in order to make that more precise, I want to introduce some terminology, um, so-called species. So um, a species, what I'm calling a species, or technically a colored non-symmetric species, is just a span of sets of this form. So it's two sets, V and C, together with a pair of functions that we're calling I and O. Of, um, I goes from V to uh, C star and O goes from V to C. And we think of this as follows. So we think of C as a set of colors and V as a set of nodes. And I tells you for each node, its list of input colors and O tells you the unique output color. <clears throat> so a species is a lot like an operad, except that it doesn't have built in a notion of composition. <clears throat> We're not saying that we can compose nodes. We're just saying that there are nodes and that they have inputs and outputs. Now, we also are going to say we're going to consider finite species, which are also called polynomial species. Um, and a species is finite just in case both of these sets are finite. There's also a notion of morphism between species, which is just a little diagram like this. So it's a pair of functions between the colors and the nodes, which makes this diagram commute. And so species can be organized into a category. And now the point is that there's a free forgetful junction between the category of species and the category of operas. So as I said, a species is like an operad without composition. Conversely, to any operad, there is an on underlying species, which is, you know, we take C to be the set of colors and we take V to be the set of operations of the operad. And we just forget about the composition and identity. Um, and now conversely, to any species, we can associate a free operad that we write free of S. And this gives a free forgetful adjunction. And th there's a way of representing the operations of the free operator over species concretely as trees. I'll say a bit more about that uh, later, but it's, you know, intuitively, that's what's going on. If we think of the, the a species as defining the nodes of a tree, then when we, when we go to turn it into an operator, we can freely compose the nodes to build up trees. Okay, so now we have enough to define um, a context-free grammar of arrows in a category. So we're gonna take this as our definition of a context-free grammar over a category. So it's gonna be a tuple of, well, a category C. Uh, and in the paper we wrote, there's a, you know, a technical condition that the category is finitely generated, though we don't really need it. But if you think of the, the the grammar that we're defining is only ever going to select um, it's a finitely generated subset of the arrows of C, so, so we, we can put this condition, but it's not really important. So again, a grammar consists of a category C, a finite species S, together with a distinguished color um, that we also call S for the start symbol of the species S, and a functor of operands from three of S, into the spliced arrow operand of C. So from free of S into W of C. That's our definition of context-free grammar. And such a grammar generates a context-free language of arrows that we call LG. And it's the subset of arrows in C, 
which, uh, if we look at them as constants of this spliced error operand, are in the image of the functor, in the image of uh, a constant of color s. So in other words, summarizing it here, it's the set, it's the image under P, so P of alpha, where alpha is a constant of type S in the free operand. That's how we define the language associated to a grammar. And then um, it's not hard to check just by you know, what I, the translation that I described to you, how we can represent classical context-free grammars in this way, that a language is context-free in the classical sense. So a language as a subset of strings, just in case it's the language of arrows of a context-free grammar over this one object category corresponding to the free monoid over sigma. Um, but of course, we're gonna be interested in this notion for more general categories. And so again, to, to illustrate that, here's again, looking at this example that I showed you before, but now we're just, we're thinking of this as living over a category. So B sigma, which is a one object category. And this is basically the exact same picture I showed you before, but I've just annotated a little bit. Um, so here really what we showed on the left-hand side corresponding to the production rules is the species, the finite species. And so every one of the production rules corresponds to a little node of our species, which can be colored like so. <clears throat> and then we map it down to this uh, W of B sigma, this spliced arrow operand of B sigma. And the only difference here now, instead of writing epsilon, I've written identity because the identity morphism corresponds to the, the epsilon uh, string. And then on the right, I've, I've written free S here because this derivation really lives inside of the free operand rather than in the species itself. Um, so as I said, you know, this gives a more general notion of context-free grammar over a category, which lets you do some things which you can't do with classical context-free grammars, which, which I think are actually kind of interesting. Um, so I'll introduce this, this terminology that we like to use of gap types. The, the idea is that this context-free grammar, the non-terminals really are sorted um, in the sense that you know, this functor P assigns to every non-terminal, it assigns it a color of the splice arrow operad uh, with, where the colors are pairs of objects. So we write like we write this sometimes. So if R is a non-terminal, we write R um, subset AB. This is using our notation for type refinement. And it just means that it's mapped by the functor P, that P of R is, is AB. And we think of R as refining this gap type. And so in, in general, if you have a grammar with a start symbol S that has refines the, the gap type AB, then it's going to generate a language which is a subset of this home set uh, of, for AB, the arrows from A, B, from A to B inside the category C. And um, just a very simple example of how this can be useful. So instead of taking a one object category, B sigma, we can take a two object category, um, which we, we call B sigma top, which we get from B sigma by freely adjoining an object that we call top together with an arrow that we call dollar from star into top. So again, star was the object of B sigma, the unique object of B sigma. Now we add in one object and one arrow dollar. And uh, you can think of this category B sigma top as encoding strings that can have an explicit end of input marker. Dollar is like an explicit end of input. And so then a context-free grammar over this B sigma top can have production rules that explicitly refer to the end of input. And this is actually something which is used in practice in the literature, but usually it is analyzed in, in a more ad hoc way where dollar is just a special symbol. Um, and you know, in the original paper on LR parsing of, of Don Knuth, he, he includes these rules. So in order to simplify his analysis, he adds what he called a zeroth production rule, a special symbol S prime, which goes to S dollar. And we can think of it, analyzing it in these terms, we can think of S as a, as a classical non-terminal that, that refines star star, whereas S prime refines star top. And so in a sense, it's, it's a, aware of the end of input. <clears throat> um, but this is just a basic example. There's more interesting you know, examples 
that are coming up, hopefully. And including a very important example is that we can define context-free grammars over the runs of automata, a finite state automata. Uh, so now um, more about, about analyzing this notion. So various uh, standard properties that people talk about for context-free grammars in, in the classical literature can be expressed nicely in terms of this functorial view and can actually be stated generally for context-free grammars of arrows. So if you're familiar with these properties, with this terminology before, then you can try to think about how these properties I'm describing, um, how they really are equivalent to the classical notions. If you're not familiar, that's okay. You can just take these as definitions. So for example, a grammar is said to be linear just in case the species S only has nodes of arity one or less. Um, then it's left linear uh, if, if and only if it's linear, and moreover, the unary nodes are all mapped to operations of the form identity gap W. And there's a dual notion of right linear, which is the same except it's mapped to W dash identity, and the classical result is that left linear or equivalently right linear grammars are equivalent to regular languages. Now, there's also a notion of bilinear, which appears in the literature, which is a generalization of so-called Chomsky normal form. It has a very natural definition. It, here, it's just um, when, when the species has nodes of ART less than or equal to two. Now, a grammar is said to be unambiguous, just in case for any constants, any pair of constants of type S for the start symbol, in the free operad, if they're mapped to the same operation by P, then they're equal. And this condition, it looks a lot, if you think about it, like the condition of P being faithful, though it's specialized to constants of type S. So this is actually a weaker condition than P being faithful. Um, a non-terminal R is said to be nullable, just in case there exists a constant alpha of type R, which is mapped to the identity. <coughs> um, and a non-terminal is said to be useful, just in case you can think of, a, there's a constant of type S which factors via a constant of type R. So in other words, there's a constant of type R together with a unary operation R or S. And now, um, if you have a grammar that has no useless non-terminals, then in fact, it's unambiguous if and only if the functor P is faithful. <clears throat> now, another thing from the classical uh, literature on context-free languages is that they have some closure properties, some basic closure properties. So, um, so they're closed under union. If you have two context-free languages, then so is their union. And we can express this in a more precise way. So if L1 and L2 are two context-free subsets of the HOM um, in C from A to B, then so is their union. Um, now, context-free languages are also closed under concatenation. We can express a more refined version of this for, uh, for context-free languages of arrows. Here we have L1 through Ln, which are subsets of the HOM, you know, CA1, B1, uh, CA and BN. And now suppose we have an operation of the, of the spliced arrow operad, W0, WN, um, of the appropriate type. Then the splice concatenation, this thing where we take, you know, we take elements of L1 through LN and we intersperse, we splice these words W0 through WN, that's going to be a context-free language of arrows as well. Now, they're also closed under the functorial image in the sense that if L is a context-free subset of C, A, B, and F is a functor from C to D, then, uh, then F of L, the image of L under F, is also context-free. It's a context-free language of arrows in D. And the proofs of these, th these are really variations of um, the proofs for the classical context-free grammars. And so I recommend to try to prove these as an exercise maybe after the talk. Um, something else that we can say, something that we call the translation principle. So if you have two grammars over the same category, now suppose that you have a fully faithful functor of operas that we're calling T from free of S1 to free of S2, which, um, you know, such that you know, P1 is equal to T followed by P2, and also T maps the start symbol of, of G1 to the start symbol of G2. In that case, the two languages are the same. 
So the language generated by G1 is exactly the language generated by, by G2. And um, th this, is, this is kind of an interesting principle. I mean, it's important that, in fact, you know, the, the two operads are not necessarily isomorphic. We're just asking that there's a fully faithful functor from one free opera to the other. So an example of how you can use this that we discuss in the paper, for any context-free grammars of arrows, there is an equivalent bilinear context-free grammar. So there's a bilinear gra context-free grammar that generates the same language. And you can do this by defining a fully faithful functor from the the free operand over a species to a free operand over a bilinear species. Um, now, <coughs> now <clears throat> I'm going to talk very quickly about this because I want to get <clears throat> to more uh, to more material and talk about the, this Chomsky, Schutz, and Baget theorem. <clears throat> but uh, as I said at the beginning, one of the motivations for this work was the idea that you know, on the one hand, you can look at type systems and, and you can look at typing as a lifting problem where we start with a term and now we try to lift it along a functor to a typing derivation. And under this functorial view of context-free grammars, you can look at parsing in the same way where we have a word and now we want to lift it along the functor to a derivation in a context-free grammar. And so, so we can look at parsing as a lifting problem along this functor. And, and this is in a sense dual to the problem of generation, which you know, often we're interested in the problem of parsing. And in the paper, we talk more about how you can look at this, you know, one high level way of looking at this is in terms of the correspondence between functors of categories, <clears throat> DRT and lax functors um, from T into the bicategory of spans of sets. Um, so if you're familiar with this, then you know what I'm talking about. If you're not, then you can look in the paper for more about this. Um, just an intuition for this idea is that this, this lax functor from T to span of set is going to give for every, um, for every object of T is going to give a fiber of objects lying over it in D. And also for every morphism in T, it's going to give the fiber of liftings of that morphism to D. And the reason why this is lax is because if you have a lifting of a morphism U and a lifting of a morphism V, then you can combine those to get a lifting of a morphism of UV. But conversely, if you have a lifting of UV, you don't necessarily, um, you cannot, it's not necessarily the case that you can split it up into a lifting of U and a lifting of V. That's why this functor is only lax in general. But that's that's a, a classical idea, and it can be extended smoothly to functors of operads. And um, and Aaron's and Lumsdain have introduced the terminology of a displayed category for this view of of a functor DRT as a lax functor from T into span set, and we we use the same terminology of displayed operad for a lax functor of operads from T into span set. Now, where T is in operad, and we see span set as as an operad, or really a two categorical operad. And I'll just mention um, that in the paper we talk a little bit about how you can derive an inductive formula for displayed free operats because again we're thinking of you know we're, we're looking at particular kinds of functors where we have a, a functor of operats from a free operat to uh, to an arbitrary operat and so we can give a formula for computing these fibers a general formula and then we can instantiate it to context free grammars and we relate that to uh, to so-called CYK parsing. And uh, you, the way that it's usually expressed is for grammars in Chomsky normal form, but actually there's a nice paper of Leomarkes where he talks about how you can, you can naturally formulate the CYK algorithm more generally for bilinear grammars, and you can solve it in cubic time. And we really give a, a reconstruction, rational reconstruction in the sense of, of uh, Leermarker's algorithm. Now, with the remaining time, I want to talk, to work our way towards this chomsky schutz and Vajde representation theorem. And in order to do that, first I need to talk about automata. Now, another reminder about finite state automata. <clears throat> so here's a picture um, of a 
an NDFA, a non-deterministic finite state automata, which recognizes a little regular language. I've shown the corresponding regular expression, um, but this is just an arbitrary example. And so I hope that you're familiar with these kinds of pictures. <clears throat> We're showing a little graph where the edges are annotated by letters coming from an alphabet. With, okay, we have the two letters A and B. And then the nodes uh, are numbered. They correspond to states of the automaton. And then we read this as saying, like, for example, this arrow from zero to one um, is a transition from state zero to state one along the letter A. Whereas if the automaton reads the letter B, then it will transition from zero to three. Um, this, is a, this is actually a non-deterministic automaton because, for example, if you're in the state zero, you could go from zero to one along the letter A, but you could also just loop back to yourself. So this is a non-deterministic automaton. And it has an, an initial state, zero. And here we've also marked an accept, uh, one accepting state, which is when it will accept the, the string. And um, I'll just remark that there's no epsilon transitions. And for all that I'm talking about, whenever I talk about non-deterministic automata, I'm going to be talking about automata without epsilon transitions. Now, from this picture, which is kind of the usual picture, we can go very smoothly to a picture like this, where we see an automaton as a functor again. Now, all I've, that I've done, I've split the automaton in two pieces. So on the one hand, we have a category Q, which is, um, it's generated by the states and the transitions of the automaton. In fact, it's a freely generated category in this example. Um, so it has objects 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and then it has arrows generated by transitions. But now this category below is going to be this B sigma again. It's going to be you know, the monoid of words seen as a one object category. And now I've indicated this functor just by the colors if you can see that. So for example, this arrow um, in red is mapped down to A. This arrow in blue is mapped down to B and, and so on. And so I've represented exactly the same information about the automaton, but now as a functor from a category of states and transitions to a uh, one object category of words. But now it turns out this isn't an arbitrary functor. In fact, this functor has some special properties. And so for one, it's finitary in the following sense that the fiber of every object um, and of every arrow is, is a finite set. So if we go to this category and, and we look at, you know, so this object, okay, there's five uh, objects above it. Um, the, the morphism A, has one, two, three, four morphisms above it. But also if we compose morphisms in here, so for example, if you take AA or AAB, you'll see that there's going to be only finitely many morphisms lying above it. <clears throat> so there's also an equivalent way of expressing this finitary condition in terms of this, you know, this lax functor business. And it's saying that this lax functor from T into span set factors via span of fin set. Now, there's another important property of this functor, which is that it is, uh, it has the unique lifting of factorizations property, or is ULF, and th this terminology comes from uh, Lavier and, and many, and it's related to what I was saying over before about um, the laxness of this functor in the span set, and and a, a functor P is said to be ULF just in case, whenever you have a morphism. Um, and an arrow alpha, <clears throat> which uh, decomposes below as the composition of U and V, <clears throat> then it will decompose uniquely as, as the composition of some beta and gamma, which lift U and V. And, and this condition is equivalent exactly to saying that this lax functor from T to span set is in fact a pseudo functor. And so now um, a, a basic observation is that this functor <clears throat> <clears throat> that the functor that I showed you here, it's both finitary and ULF. And in fact, in general, a functor over this category, B sigma, is going to be the underlying uh, like bare automaton 
of uh, an NDFA, bare automaton in the sense that we you know, we haven't indicated the initial and accepting states, but just we're just looking at the the states on the transitions. So. A functor is the underlying bare tongue of an NDFA with an alphabet sigma, just in case P is both finitary and ULF. And we're going to use this no. now as motivation to introduce this definition. Okay, so no. I, I, if you want to yes. tell you that's 10 minutes to 11, okay? 10 minutes to 11. Okay. Yeah, so, you know, you finish officially your, you know, anytime now you're going to walk, walk into the question time, but that's fine. Just carry on. Okay. So, so I'll I'll try to go quickly in five minutes. I think I can I can finish. So, okay, the idea we can define an NDFA over a category now as a category C, another category Q, a functor from Q to C, and then a pair of objects that we see as the initial and accepting states. Um, and this functor is going to be a finitary ULF functor. And this is going to allow us to generate a language of arrows in C, which is going to be just those arrows which can be lifted along the functor P to an arrow from Q0 to QF. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> you know, there's a small point that this we're taking a, a single accepting state, so a single initial state and a single accepting state. Sometimes people consider um, many accepting states. It, it, it turns out to be natural to take just a single accepting state, but it's, it's, a, it's a minor point. Now, um, I'll say quickly that we can use exactly the same definition now to define automata over operads, where we can explain what it means to be finitary in ULF for a functor of operads, and we can define an NDFA over an operad as a pair of operads related to a functor together with a single state, which is the accepting state, uh, corresponding to a color of Q. And this will generate a language of operations in O. And in fact, it's interesting that this recovers the notion of tree automaton, undeterministic finite state tree automaton, if you take O to be a free operand. But, but in fact, this notion is more general. And in particular, we use this fact that whenever we have, we have an NDFA, an ordinary NDFA that we can see as a functor of categories, we can map it using this spliced arrow operand um, functor to a functor between spliced arrow operads, and this functor is going to preserve these properties of being finitary in ULF. So given an NDFA over a category, you get an NDFA over its corresponding spliced arrow operad. Now, I want to go quickly to, to tell you this representation theorem just in lightning speed, but I'll show you some pictures. And again, there's a classic, the classical statement that any context-free language is the image of the intersection of a dyke language with a regular language. We reformulate this. In fact, we give a, a slightly more general version. I mean, we give a more general version for languages of arrows. <clears throat> and the proof relies on two, uh, two general constructions. One is to take the pullback of a context-free grammar along an NDFA, and we use this to construct the intersection of a context-free language with a regular language. And then there's this construction called the contour category of an operand. And the idea is that this lets us define a so-called universal context-free grammar for any um, species equipped with a start symbol. Now, <clears throat> I think I'm going to skip over this All right, I'll say that, that we can define this pullback of a context-free grammar along an NDFA in a very natural way. And this is going to then, um, this is going to define the ideas. It's going to define a context-free grammar over runs of an automaton. If you just look at this, this diagram, we start with a context-free gra grammar, we pull it back in along an automaton by, by pulling it along the corresponding um, uh, automaton over the operand of spliced words. And now we get a context-free grammar over runs of the automaton, which we, then we can push forward back along the functor to compute the intersection. I wanted to say something about this contour category at lightning speed. Uh, it does define a general construction from operads to categories. <clears throat> I'll, I'll just show you the pictures, the, the, the pictorial definition. So the idea is that given an operad, um, we're going to define a category where the objects 
corresponds to the colors of the opera together with an orientation, a bit which says um, orienting up or down. And so now, like if we have here a ternary operation F of the opera, it's going to correspond to four arrows of this contour category, one which goes from R up to R1 up, one that goes from R1 down to R2 up, from R2 down to R3 up, from R3 down to R to Rd. And we call these F0, F1, F2, F3. You can think of these as the sectors of the operation. Any An n-ary operation has n plus one sectors. And okay, we need to impose some equations on this category, on composition in this category in order to really um, get an adjoint to the spliced arrow construction. But the idea, the point is that in fact, it does define a left adjoint. And, and what can we say about it? So <clears throat> the fact that it's an adjunction means that uh, you can associate to any species a universal context-free grammar, um, a universal in the sense that whenever we have a functor uh, from you know, free of S to W of C, it will factor via the unit of the adjunction. And so the unit of the adjunction generates a context-free grammar, um, a universal context-free grammar associated to the species, which we call a language of tree contour words. And I will just show you a picture to, to illustrate what, what that means. I mean, the idea, like here is an operation of a species corresponding to a tree. And we can encode this as a word, this word that I've shown here, A0, B0, A1, C0, and so on. And these are encoding, you can think of it as a, a traversal around the boundary of the tree, seen, you know, this operation of the opera is seen as a tree. So here we, you know, we have the zeroth corner of A, the node A, now we see the zeroth corner of B, now we have the oneth corner of A, and so on. And so we've encoded the tree as a word in this language of tree contour words. Now I'm getting to the end of time. And uh, I will say just the idea of the representation theorem, the idea that you can generate any context-free language in three pieces, you you, you can generate uncolored tree contour words, which describe just the shapes of trees in a species. Then you can use an automaton, a finite state automaton, to check that these contour words, including trees, can be well colored according to the species and you know, having the root color. And then we can just interpret the, the corners of the word as an appropriate arrow in your grammar. And I have... Um, some pictures illustrating that for our example. So uh, this example, the idea is we forget about the colors and we just look at this uncolored species. We, we just have these nodes and you know, then we can combine these nodes in arbitrary ways. So for example, we can generate a contour word which corresponds to the encoding of Tom loves mom, but also one which corresponds to Tom mom and loves mom Tom, these non-sentences. But then finally, we can use an automaton to rule these out. And this automaton really comes from this contour category construction. So um, I apologize for going over time. As I said, I wasn't sure about the timing of this talk, um, but that's, that's, the base, that's, the, that's it. And I'll be happy to take questions and if people want me to, to go more slowly over some of the material as well. Well, so thank, thank you, you so much. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's very good to, it's a long, um, it's a long talk with lots of different bits. So I think <laughs> I think we'll need to kind of unpack it in, in several different talks eventually, but that, that was a very good, um, general discussion. Uh, have David has a question. So David, go ahead, please. Oh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, Just yeah. So I, I really enjoyed the talk. I'm just wondering, because I'm, I'm uh, coming from a background in math, trying to really uh, understand computing machines as they exist in the real world and describe them mathematically. And I, I really like the math. Oh, you can't hear me? Yes, I can hear. Oh, um, what I'm wondering is, uh, like, 
non-deterministic finite automata. Everything we've been thinking about is deterministic. Why should we? Why should I, as someone who's trying to describe computing machines, want to think about non-deterministic finite automata? Because it seems like all the computing machines are deterministic, right? Well, <clears throat> yes. It's. I mean, it's a good question. So, <clears throat> I mean, one. Uh, let me go back just to get this picture. <clears throat> so. So you, you can also talk about deterministic automaton. One, one answer to your question is that you, you can talk about uh, deterministic automaton, and in, you can really think about that as, I mean, a, a classical deterministic automaton, if you encode it this way, is going to correspond to a functor, which is not just ULF, but in fact is a discrete op vibration. And, and that says that whenever you're at a state, like the state, uh, you know, state one, and then now you have an arrow in the base corresponding to a letter, you can push forward that state and you will arrive at a unique new state. And so, so you can talk about, about deterministic finite state automaton in, in, this, in this way as exactly as discrete op vibrations. Um, but there, you know, sometimes it's useful to work with non-deterministic automaton because it's more it's more general, and many constructions, you know, work or are, na are naturally expressed on non-deterministic automaton, um, and then you can also you can always determinize a non-deterministic finite state automaton to a, to a deterministic automaton. But that's like many times it's useful to work with non-deterministic automaton until the end, then you determinize at the end and get a deterministic automaton. Okay, thanks. Right, I, I'm not seeing um, any other questions and I don't know if I mean, I'm not saying much <laughs> at the moment because, um, so I, I kind of wanted to, to check on, on something a, a little bit more about the preliminaries of this stuff. So it's the species here, the same species as, as Joyao's species or, or is a different concept known? It's it's related. I, I mean, so, so as I said, technically it's a, you know, colored non-symmetric species, what I'm calling a species that, colored non-symmetric species and what Joel called species are uncolored symmetric species. Oh. So, I mean, it, it's really the same idea, but without this symmetric action and now a colored version because we want to use it to, to express uh, grammars. Right. <laughs> and and uh, one more question on this business of set, setting it up in the middle uh, of, of other work, did did Philippe de Groot not produce any categorical old-fashioned version of, of 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 the deductive system, or, or not? I mean, you say that he used lambda calculus, but normally lambda calculus kind of comes with some Cartesian closed category or something. So, kind of, do you know? Yeah. So, no, I think in his in his papers on the subject with, also with, with co-authors, they were working just in a formal framework with, with lambda calculus and talking also about translations between signatures. Um, so yeah, tr tr translations between signatures that generate lambda terms, which you can see as functors. Um, I mean, so, no, so the answer is that no, they didn't talk explicitly about categories, but I've talked about it with him as well, I mean, and I think he had some intuitions in the background, and um, also he was interested in this earlier work with with uh, Paul André about type refinement systems. Mm -hmm. We we already saw connections to his work back then when we were doing that work, and and he was interested in in trying to apply it to to model what what he was doing, and so here we saw another connection actually. I see. I mean, so I think that his work would be very naturally expressed in terms of of uh, categories and, and operas and, and functors between them, but this hasn't been done explicitly as far as I know. Fantastic. Um, I think we should clap, uh, we, we should thank you again for the talk and, and stop the recording and, and then we can have a, a few more questions uh, if people have them. I have one. <laughs> but